This video is brought to you by NordVPN, the best online VPN service for speed and security. Check out the link in the description or stick around to the end of the video to learn more. Hey everyone, and welcome back to High Speed Rail Explained for this very special episode on one of the world's original and greatest high speed rail systems, the French Train et Grande Vitesse or TGV. The TGV system has completely transformed the geography of France, revolutionized modern rail travel, and done so with innovative trains and high speed lines with designs and engineering that are still sometimes unmatched today. And France's high speed rail success has now stretched far beyond the country. Indeed, much of Europe's passenger railway network is being shaped around the French TGV. And French high speed rail technology has been fundamental to creating a number of other high speed rail services around the world. So let's dive in to see what makes the TGV so special and why it's unlike any other high speed train system out there. Welcome to RM Transit, a channel about high speed rail networks and how they work. France was Europe's first country to build a high speed rail system. Hot on the heels of Japan with the Shinkansen and the beginning of Europe's first high speed rail network came with the LGV Sud S opening in 1981. The first high speed line covering the roughly 400 kilometers between Lyon and Paris shrunk what had been an over 4 hour journey to reliably just under 2 and set the stage for the European high speed rail model. As it turns out though, things almost took a completely different direction, as the French TGV or Very High Speed Train program was originally meant to use trains powered by gas turbines. But as the energy crisis of the 1970s as well as the massive scale up in nuclear power generation, which makes up most of the country's electrical power these days, came around, the decision was made to go with more conventional overhead wire power, although it wasn't entirely conventional because it was extremely high voltage. But that didn't mean the trains weren't special. For one, they had a very high power to weight ratio and were very light, allowing for less force to be applied to the rails at high speeds. To achieve this, they utilized shared Jacobs bogies, though unlike high speed trains at the time in Japan and these days in most of the world, all high speed trains in France use a dual bookend locomotive setup, with the original trains also having one powered bogie on the first passenger cars as well. Unlike in Japan where new high speed railways were built as an entirely separate network from conventional trains with totally separate tracks and rolling stock, the breakthrough of the TGV was its trains which could also operate on the conventional network for the final jog into some cities, and to provide connecting services. This means LGVs, or high speed lines, could be built for lower costs in between the major cities instead of through them, and trains could easily still serve the historic stations right in the city centers. Passengers could stay on the same train for journeys beyond the high speed line, connecting to places like smaller French cities and international destinations like Geneva in Switzerland, where high speed lines still don't connect. And while running on traditional railways for parts of journeys was a huge factor that helped keep high speed rail affordable, a lot of other features of the French high speed network made it one of the most cost effective in the world to build. For one, contrasted with lines in other parts of Europe and the world, LGVs have fairly steep grades, made possible by the high power and inertia of the trains, and this allowed tunnels seen in places like Germany and elevated viaducts widely seen on the Chinese and Japanese high speed rail systems to mostly be avoided, alongside a willingness to split and recombine farms as lines pass through rural areas. This at grade construction was also partly assisted by the use of cut and fill, where soil from sections of lines in cutting would be used to create adjacent embankments. After the creation of the first high speed line, which was hugely successful and perennially near capacity in large part because of the important decision not to price high speed trains as a premium service, the rest really was history, with new lines being built over the decades to Marseille, Strasbourg, Lille and Calais, Le Mans and Rennes, and Bordeaux, as well as a line into the Rhine Rhone region. The great success of the TGV has meant a massive reduction in flights between cities served by high speed services, so much so that laws are slowly coming into place that will ban short haul flights where rail is a competitive option. The popularity of France's high speed rail meant international service to surrounding countries was quickly being pursued, and that meant developing multi mode trains that could handle different power supplies and signaling systems. These days, there are TGV services to basically all surrounding countries, meaning France's high speed rail network is really the core of the European high speed rail network. High speed trains can travel into Spain by way of Montpellier and Barcelona, to Italy through Lyon and Turin, and to Germany through Strasbourg as well as Karlsruhe, and into the Low Countries by way of Lille. 
with these services running on mostly contiguous high-speed line with TGV trains owned by Talus, which serve destinations as far away as Amsterdam and Cologne, and need to sometimes be equipped for compatibility with as many as four different power systems. If you're curious about any of those high-speed train networks, you should check out the playlist in the top right corner because I've made explainer videos about all four of them. Of course, we can't forget the high-speed Eurostar service, which is also the new name for Talus to the UK, which uses the northern high-speed line from Paris to Lille and the Channel Tunnel to cross to the United Kingdom, where trains use high-speed 1, which utilizes French standards and signaling to connect to St. Pancras International Station. These services actually originally used customized TGV rolling stock. If you want to learn more about high-speed rail in the UK, make sure you're subscribed because we'll have a video coming soon. Now, despite Paris acting in many ways like the center of the European high-speed rail network, TGV trains do not run through the city center, with trains instead using conventional lines to get to the historic termini dotted throughout the city that you can learn more about in our Paris RER explainer. This can make transferring between trains a bit of a pain, and a cross-city high-speed rail link like Madrid would probably be a good idea. Fortunately, Paris has a wicked trick up its sleeve. The suburban LGV interconnection line connects the high-speed lines to the south, east, and north of Paris, in theory allowing for direct service from locations in northern France and the Low Countries, as well as Germany and the east of France, to the south of France as well as Italy and Spain. Better yet, the suburban location of the interconnection means it also beautifully connects to Marne-la-Vallée, a new town that's home to Disneyland Paris as well as a ton of shopping centers and an RERA connection, and Charles de Gaulle Airport with its RERB connection. This allows for direct TGV service to two major Paris destinations that aren't really in Paris, and helps popularize the idea of connecting high-speed rail to airports to facilitate international travel. To be clear, French high-speed rail does have some serious issues. Decentralization around Paris means fast trips to the capital, but not necessarily between other parts of the country, something only exacerbated by the hollowing out of regional train services which often are rather infrequent and much in need of upgrading. There's also a concerning trend towards the airplaneization of high-speed rail. With point-to-point -point services that make almost no stops, the lack of a solid clock based schedule, and outlying stations in many cities, which all give up a lot of the benefits of rail to be more like the thing rail has displaced. Maybe all the executives working for airlines killed by high-speed trains found new jobs working on high-speed trains. In fact, SNCF, the French National Railway, even kicked off the trend of low-cost high-speed rail carriers with its WeGo high-speed services that can get you from Paris to Lyon in an older TGV train for just a few euros, but which often stop at stations far out of town. Despite this, France clearly has one of Europe's and the world's best high-speed rail systems that can get you between most major cities in the country quickly and affordably, and moves enormous numbers every single year. And the good news is that this great system is going to get even bigger. One of the current limitations of the TGV network is it doesn't connect to enough of France, and so improvements are being made to regional train lines in Normandy and connecting to Nice so that a mix of TGV and fast regional services can provide better options. The next big proper LGV will be an extension of the LGV Sud Europe Atlantique, which connects Paris to Bordeaux, further southeast to Toulouse, famous for being the home of Airbus, and less famous for having a very impressive metro system that is quite similar to the one in Rennes, as well as trams and a new 3S gondola. The high-speed route to Toulouse will be roughly 220 kilometers long, and will connect Paris to the city in about three hours. Beyond the projects within France, there are also a number of major projects which will improve connections to surrounding countries. The biggest of these is the new Lyon-Turin railway, which will provide a modern, if not entirely high-speed rail link between the two cities. This line will feature the world's longest rail tunnel, with an under-construction base tunnel in the Alps that is almost 60 kilometers long and just barely exceeds the length of the Gotthard base tunnel in Switzerland. While the line often gets referred to as being high-speed, it's only going to allow passenger trains to travel a bit over 200 kilometers per hour. Although, compared to meandering roads and existing rail options, this is very much a high-speed option. The design of the new railway will have much gentler curves and grades than the existing one, and like Gotthard, has a significant freight component. When the entire railway is complete, the French and Italian high-speed rail networks will be properly connected, allowing trips between Paris and Milan in just four hours. There are also two new high-speed lines which will improve connections between France's TGV network and Spain's Ave. 
two roughly 150 km routes are planned, with one completing an entirely high-speed route between Paris and Barcelona by extending the existing LGV from Montpellier to Perpignan, and another advancing a direct high-speed link between Madrid and Paris by extending the LGV Sud Europe Atlantique to Dax from Bordeaux, putting the TGV network within 100 km or so of the Ave-connected cities of San Sebastian and Pamplona. Of course, the TGV network would be nothing without its high-speed trains. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, every single high-speed train used in France on the TGV network is from Alstom, and while there have been many designs over the years, all newer trains are of the bi-level TGV duplex design, which features a fully walk-through upper level, Jacob's bogies, and significantly more seats than older single-level variants, although keeping the train within the low weight requirements of the infrastructure was a significant engineering challenge. Unlike the original TGV rolling stock, the duplex cars do not feature powered bogies in the end passenger cars, and to replace much of the older rolling stock still in operation, a new model known as the TGV-M is being built, which continues to use the duplex design but with sleeker power cars, a higher top speed, and better energy efficiency. Arguably, one of the biggest successes of the TGV rolling stock has been its success in being exported. Interestingly, a single-deck model similar to the TGV-M is already waiting to be deployed in the US on the Amtrak Acela high-speed rail service, which currently also uses trains developed with TGV technology. While the new trains are having a lot of issues being deployed, they should provide a much better passenger experience when they do finally enter service. TGV rolling stock has also been exported for use on the Spanish high-speed rail network. And even more significantly, the entire infrastructure and trains initially introduced on the Moroccan and Korean high-speed rail systems were entirely of French design, with the original KTX rolling stock resembling the TGV Rizzo and the Albarac rolling stock being a TGV duplex derivative. All in all, the TGV is one of the greatest engineering achievements in history, combining incredible railway infrastructure with extremely impressive trains to deliver what is one of the most successful high-speed railways in the world. Now, I was lucky enough to be able to travel to Europe to see some incredible transit both in operation and currently under construction. You've already seen my videos from Berlin, and there'll be some really exciting tours coming soon. I've got some more plans to travel in 2024 and to bring you on-location coverage of international transit, and it's all very exciting. I always like to travel with a VPN ready on my devices, and NordVPN has been a stable presence for the past couple of trips I've taken. I use Nord to stay protected when I'm using public Wi-Fi, and I'm able to connect to a server back home in Canada to access apps and websites that aren't available wherever I am. Bank websites in particular are incredibly pesky about this. With a single NordVPN subscription, I can also get access for up to six devices at once on every major platform, so I don't have to worry about being able to access internet safely on my work MacBook and Android phone, or share it with my wife whenever we're binging a show together. As you might know, my full-time career is on the internet, so it's even more crucial that I can get my work done safely no matter where I am. NordVPN comes with threat protection, an advanced anti-malware feature that blocks intrusive ads and web trackers, so that my content, my business, and myself can stay safe and I can keep bringing you new content. And now, NordVPN even offers a proxy browser extension, which means I can browse the internet safely and enjoy the comforts of threat protection even if I'm on a public device abroad without the hassle of needing to download an app and allowing me to choose which websites I want to use a VPN to connect to. It's lightweight, focused on browser traffic only, and you can even set and forget it and have the VPN connect automatically whenever you boot up your browser. Right now, if you go to nordvpn.com slash rmtransit, you can get an exclusive holiday deal where every purchase of the two-year plan gets four whole bonus months on top. Again, that's at nordvpn.com slash rmtransit, and make sure you're using my link so I can continue to get Nord support in the future. It's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee.